There are three uh, items on our workshop agenda today. First is an update on the no fault reform law that was implemented in 2021. Now we'll talk about a topic that's possibly even less popular than insurance, and that's inflation. And we'll talk about uh, what we expect to see for 2023 and beyond. So Brian, can you uh, tell us what's happening with the no fault law reform? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. So, Michigan's auto insurance system changed dramatically in 2020. And I think for most of our clients, you probably feel like that's been uh, beaten uh, like a dead horse, uh, in large part because we provide a lot of uh, content and, and information, and there were a lot of things that required attention and things that had changed even after the fact. So, uh, most of us have, have probably become familiar with the fact that there was at least some change to Michigan's auto insurance law back in 2020. So can anybody tell me what what one thing that may have changed when our law in Michigan changed in 2020? We're not going to fight up here. All right, that's a fail for Borer Insurance Group. John, yes, save us. Medical coverage. Bingo. Okay, so medical coverage. There were several changes that trickled down from that, but the big change that happened in 2020 was that Michigan no longer required that every auto insurance policy in the state have unlimited medical coverage provided by that policy. Now, most people, especially in West Michigan, still have unlimited coverage for their medical expenses if they are hurt in a car accident. There are several reasons for that, one of them being that coverage is not that expensive on our side of the state, so there's not a huge incentive to reduce that coverage and take the risk of having less than unlimited coverage like everybody had had by default up until 2020. But why do I care then, right? A, a lot of us just put our heads in the sand and said, eh, I'm not going to do anything about it. Uh, hopefully it all just works out. So if I didn't do anything about the new law, how does it impact me? Can anybody tell me one reason I might care that the auto insurance law changed even though I didn't do anything about it? There's more risk. Why is that? Because I might not have changed my coverage, but the person next to me or the person behind me on the road may have changed theirs. So in the past, before our auto insurance law changed, if I was involved in a bad car accident, potentially at fault, at least I knew that that other person, by state law, was going to have unlimited coverage for their own medical expenses which means that their lawsuit against me was limited to certain things, mostly regarding their lost income if they were unable to work. Well now, I don't know if that person that I'm about to rear end or the person I'm gonna sideswipe going through that intersection still has unlimited coverage for their own injuries. They might have much less than that or even potentially none. And if that's the case, I'm potentially looking at a much larger lawsuit being filed against me because of the decision that that person made for their own coverage. Now that's their own right, they have that right to make the choice. The choice is good for consumers and we want that, but something that everyone should keep in mind is that as of 2020, all the personal injury attorneys and other estate planners uh, have advised most people, hey, you need to be aware that there's more lawsuit risk on the table every time you jump behind the wheel because you don't know if the people around you on the road or that are riding passenger seat maybe in your car if they still have unlimited coverage for their own injuries. And if they don't, they could potentially have a much larger lawsuit against you. We're going to touch on the classic umbrella insurance policy later in the presentation and why that is, of course, gaining more and more popularity as that auto insurance law becomes more and more ingrained in Michigan. So there were, of course, talk about why that law was going to change, right? And how that was driven and what's the impact, and much of it seems somewhat political. Um, there were big uh, advertisements and TV commercials about the massive premium reduction we're all going to see in the state of Michigan. So why don't you tell us a little about that, Eric? Yeah. Actually, Dave, can I see by you? I know I'm the middle child, but <laughs> still feel like I should get on the stage. Um, so premiums, what happened with them, right? Brian mentioned that politicians promised huge premium reductions, and they were right in some cases. Uh, people had the option to reduce the amount of coverage that they've had, and if they did so, they saw a somewhat substantial premium decrease. 
the same way you pay less for a smaller house, right? What really I think was important was the premium decreased to Michigan drivers that kept their coverage the same as what it's been in the past. That's what most people were looking forward to when that law came to be. So I think on average we saw a premium decrease of about 10% across the board for clients that kept their coverage the same as it's been in the past. So no, you didn't see that 50% that a lot of the politicians had promised, but uh, there was still somewhat of a premium decrease. I think maybe more importantly was the medical coverage, which had been getting a little bit out of control on auto policies, had finally slowed down a little bit. That cost of the coverage was one of the biggest drivers of insurance premium increases for the past decade or so. And to use a, a phrase that we've heard too much over the last two years, uh, NOFA reform flattened the curve a little bit with regard to the cost of that medical coverage. So, um, you know, did, um, did it work out exactly the way that they had planned? Probably not, but um, some of that has to do with the pandemic that occurred just a year after they had drafted the legislation. So, yeah, they reduced auto insurance costs uh, across the board for most cases, but they couldn't foresee the cost of repairing a vehicle or replacing a vehicle if it was total going through the roof due to inflation, supply chain issues, the oncoming pandemic. So although insurance premiums decreased uh, slightly after no-fall reform had passed, primarily due to the medical coverage, the cost of comprehensive and collision coverages has increased drastically and now we're basically in the same position as we were back in 2019 before the law passed from a total premium standpoint. So it helped. We'd be in a worse position than we are today from a cost standpoint without no fault reform, but from a budgeting standpoint, we're basically back to where we were before that. So uh, the MCCA refund, that's something that uh, probably everybody in this room was looking forward to. It wasn't really expected until it was magically announced and it put $400 per vehicle back in pretty much every driver's pocket. Um, it was dispersed in somewhat of an interesting manner by the insurance companies, but hopefully everybody got theirs. Uh, Dave, explain why that refund was uh, dispersed to Michigan drivers, okay. and tell us if there's going to be more of that in the future, if there's going to be less of that, what can we expect? Okay. Thanks, Derek. Um, you'll notice a difference in our presentation styles. These guys kind of weigh in, but old guys get to read from notes. If I don't read from notes, I'm going to talk myself right into a hole. So. Forgive me for reading from my notes a little bit. So you probably all remember the $400 per vehicle refund check you received earlier this year. It was typically around large for most companies. Um, that came from the Michigan Catastrophic Pipes Association, also known as the MCCA for short. And this is a nonprofit organization created by the state of Michigan in 1978. Um, and as the name implies, is to help pay for really bad auto accident injuries. Uh, we need the MCCA because Michigan has uh, unlimited medical coverage. They have had since the no-fault law was put in force, I think it was 1972, so up until the no-fault reform, everybody had an unlimited amount of coverage for their medical expenses from the car accident, and that is, uh, that is a ton of money for an insurance company to try to figure out what their maximum exposure is, so they needed some sort of back, backstop uh, to prevent them from getting killed by a lot of those catastrophic injuries. If, you, if they can pile up, so you might have 10 or 15 this year that are going to be lifetime injuries, and then 10 or 15 the next year, but over the course of 30 years, you might have a lot of those that are still on claim, and those expenses add up. So, insurance companies don't like that unknown risk, and actually this is the only coverage that I can think of that has an unknown maximum payout. So, the MCCA provides a backstop now, and always has, and reimburses insurance companies for expenses of over a state-mandated threshold, which is currently $600,000. So this may seem like a strange arrangement, but insurance companies buy reinsurance uh, from other insurance companies for all types of policies. So if you have an umbrella policy that's $10 million from auto owners insurance company, for example, they are not taking on that entire $10 million risk. They're going out to a reinsurance company and reinsurance, reinsuring anything maybe over $3 million, whatever their appetite is uh, at that time. So it's not uncommon for insurance companies to protect their maximum risk by buying insurance from other insurance companies, and that's called reinsurance. And the MCCA is basically just reinsurance um, mandated by the state of Michigan, and it's a nonprofit reinsurance organization. They don't make a profit. 
on the fees that they charge for this coverage, which is different from uh, the reinsurance that the insurance companies buy for other lines of coverage. They're going to a for-profit insurance company to buy that reinsurance. So in a, in a way, the MCCA is probably saving money. Uh, now, the MCCA collects their fees necessary to fund their operations through an assessment that's included on your auto insurance policy. You'll probably see it. It's listed on every policy. And if you recall, the refund checks we all received came back from our auto insurance companies, not the MCCA. And that's because the insurance companies are the conduit for collecting and returning MCCA assessments. But the MCCA is a totally separate organization. So you might wonder why we got $400 per vehicle back. Um, and it, I don't know if Derek alluded to this, but we put a fee schedule in place with that no fault reform. Um, so prior to that, insurance companies often paid as much as six times uh, what another health insurance provider would pay, such as a group health, Medicare, work uh, for the same services. So there was no fee schedule, so they were kind of like the fat, fat pig when somebody came to the emergency room from a car accident. I'm sure the medical providers were lucky in their chops because there was no specific limit on how much they could charge for their services like there is with all this other types of insurance. Um, and, if you're, and if you're a medical provider in this room, you also got to provide the best care for that person as well. Right. You, you had this big bucket of different services that you could provide to that person that was injured. You weren't going to be you know, stipulated on the Medicare allotment for what could be paid and the services that would be approved, et cetera, et cetera. Personal injury protection coverage on the auto policy basically opens the door to any type of service this person would need. And so you can provide that specialized care. You knew you were going to be paid in the morning. Oh. So the new fee schedule puts some reasonable limits on medical reimbursements. Um, and with the new fee schedule in place, the MPCA projected that the amount needed to pay future medical bills would, re would be reduced enough that they didn't need to keep all the money in reserve that they had to fund future obligations. So they refunded about $3 billion of the reserve funds, and a lot of politicians had a blast taking credit for it. So some people have asked us if this uh, reform no-fault law is here to stay. Yeah, it sure looks like it to me, uh, but laws of this magnitude often get legislative adjustments to correct the errors that were made or to clarify the intent of the law. Uh, they're well-intentioned, sometimes they make mistakes when writing the law, and then they fix them later with more legislation. And that keeps our legislators off the streets, so that's probably a good thing. Um, another source of change will be court cases to interpret vague or conflicting language in the law. Or as in a recent case, to seek remedy for a group of people who were harmed by the new law. A recent case involved people who were injured years ago and are still in need of medical care. They were suddenly made subject to a lower level of care because the new fee schedule didn't pay as much for some of their medical service. So think of brain injury patients, for example. The cost of care is very expensive. And the new fee schedule reduced the amounts paid for care. So a lawsuit was brought on their behalf, and they won. So because this case was decided in favor of all those who were injured before the reform law took effect, they will not be subject to the new medical fee schedule for their future medical expenses. And as a result of this case, the MCCA, which thought they had a surplus because of the expected savings from the new fee schedule, now needs money to fund a projected $3.7 billion deficit. So we've gone from a surplus to a deficit all of a sudden, basically over one court case. This is a principal case. <laughs> this is where it's appropriate to boo. <laughs> yeah, boo. Uh, and here's a spoiler alert. So if you don't like bad news, plug your ears right now. The MCCA will start assessing $48 per vehicle per year next July to start to recoup some of that deficit. So are we having fun or what? <laughs> so hopefully you didn't spend the $400 refund on a new pair of shoes because the MCCA is going to come back and say, we need that money back over these subsequent years based on how that court case played out. Right. So Derek, another issue that's on people's minds is inflation. How is that affecting the insurance industry? Well, um, it's affecting it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah, right, go to the next slide if you want. Yeah, so uh, there's news to me, but there's multiple types of inflation. Brian will touch on this one up here called Social inflation, uh, it's quite interesting and uh, it's having an impact on the insurance industry, that's for sure. Uh, but I got the easiest one. I got obvious inflation. So, um, you know, I, I spent last night Googling about the 
federal funds rate and the ECB and the Federal Reserve and monetary stimulus, uh, which was really nice because I didn't have to waste my night reading about how Michigan State is going to get bludgeoned by Ohio State this weekend. So that was a nice little change of pace for my nightly routine. Uh, but obvious inflation is, is, is here. I don't think anybody doubts that, right? We've seen it from a construction standpoint. We've seen it from a vehicle standpoint, whether it's being repaired or you're buying a new vehicle. Uh, you've seen it at the grocery store and when you're doing your shopping, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously uh, the, the cost of all of those inputs are being passed on to consumers and those consumers are then you know, passing them on to the next party. So it's kind of this big uh, uh, you know, mammoth of a thing where you know, you've got a little bit of chicken and the egg going, but inflation is, is here. I think nobody's gonna doubt that and it's having an impact on insurance because what does your insurance do? Protects your house and the repairs or the construction of it in your vehicle and the repairs or you know the replacement of that. And I don't think anyone would doubt that it's more costly to do that today than it's ever been in the past. So, uh, Brian, why don't you talk about the social uh, inflation aspect of it and how that has an impact on insurance? I think that's probably going to be news to a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. And um, like. Like you can obviously see with Derek up here, uh, less intelligent, but better looking. So we gave him the obvious inflation portion. Uh, social inflation is something that doesn't make the news uh, because it's not very obvious. But if you dive really deep into the insurance data over the past several years, you're gonna find something that they're calling basically a man-made inflation issue behind the scenes, totally unrelated to everything else that we all think of as inflation. And what is driving that? There are really a, a few things that are driving something that's being referred to as social inflation. The first one of them is that people are angry. In 2022, based on survey data across the entire country, people are angrier in general than they've ever been in the past. And if you've been on the road anytime recently, you've probably seen that in driving behavior. So, not only are we seeing repair costs for vehicles being higher and delayed and all that hoopla, but they're also seeing a much, uh, much increased frequency of those car accidents and then much more severity when they do happen. Uh, accidents where people haven't even touched the brakes. Uh, accidents where uh, someone was driving way over the speed limit to even a neighborhood. So this angry driving behavior is causing a massive increase in the severity of car accidents, which is leading to higher liability claims, greater repairs to vehicles, and everything else that comes with, uh, unfortunately, uh, angry driving behavior. So what is also happening um, from an inflation standpoint of social inflation is that third parties are actually investing in lawsuits. So you'll find investment companies that are pooling funds of individual investors and investing in lawsuits, which of course is encouraging higher settlement values. They're delaying all of these settlements out, so it's much more expensive to litigate. Uh, so you have this additional public pressure on these lawsuits that may have never been filed in the first place, but now are being funded by an actual investment firm, the same way that you might invest in an ETF or a bond portfolio somewhere. And most states, as of last week, have not outlawed that practice. <laughs> the third point was simply this public sentiment uh, has become very uh, punishing of the wrongdoer and very anti-corporate. And that's being reflected in the court systems almost across the entire country. Uh, in, your, in your social inflation, are you in, including the rise in car jackings, auto theft, and catalytic converter theft? I mean, those are all part of that. They're looking at that outside of the social side of it and calling it just inflation because of, you know, it's just additional problems that are a result. I mean, why are people stealing catalytic converters? Exactly. Didn't used to be the case. We saw this happen 10 years ago. Then magically that problem went away when they weren't worth anything. Now today, you're willing to take the risk of theft because precious metal values are up. You're exactly right. Yeah. And it also, you know, socially it became a trend to, you know, steal that certain type of car and put it on TikTok or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, I think as, as younger people kind of uh, try to fit into the new social norms that that generation has, you have a lot of societal behavior that's going to drive, you know, those types of costs and accordingly the insurance that goes along with it. So, Dave, if we're going to see upward 
pricing pressure, which we're already seeing in the insurance industry, what, what should we be thinking about or what can we do about it uh, to try to be budget conscious? Well, um, that's a good question. Um, personally, I, I just like to make one comment though. I think inflation is really getting out of control. But that's just my five cents. <laughs> okay, that one fell a little flat. <laughs> there are some things you can do to control the cost of your insurance. Number one, review your policies, see if there's any fringe coverages on there, any additional coverages that you've had in the past <clears throat> that you may not need uh, currently, or maybe you don't need as much of. Um, sometimes you do need to change your insurance to increase things or change things because things have changed in your life. But once in a while, maybe you've outgrown coverage that you no longer need. So review your policy uh, with that, that in mind. Um, also, you want to check your deductibles on your auto and home insurance. Uh, higher deductibles result in lower premiums. And they also reduce the inclination to turn in small claims, which over the long haul does keep your insurance costs under control. And the third thing you might want to do is review the amount of coverage on your house. <clears throat> You'll probably see an automatic increase in the coverage on your house between 9 and 16 percent this year. And that's just an inflation protection to keep up with the increased cost of construction. And insurance companies apply that automatically based on factors that, that they get from professional building appraisal companies throughout the country. Um, <clears throat> and we, many studies say that a lot of homes are underinsured for the cost to replace them with new construction. But once in a while, we do come across one that looks like it kind of got out of whack, got a little too high. So keep that in mind. And if you do want to review the limit of coverage on your house, we can uh, complete a new replacement cost estimate and make uh, adjustments if appropriate. But when you do look at your policy, keep in mind that it should be insured for the cost to replace it with new construction, not the market value. So a lot of people look at the market value or think about the market value and they see a limit on their house and they don't seem to match up, so they think they've got a problem. But Market value is really not a factor in the insurance policy. It's really the cost to replace the house with new, with new construction. Um, on a side note, if you insure things like boats, trailers, recreational vehicles, or maybe you've added some extra coverage for an outbuilding you've got. If you've got a big outbuilding and the policy might provide $50,000 of coverage automatically, but it costs maybe $100,000 to replace it, you've probably added $50,000 of extra coverage for it. And that, those things are not automatically adjusted for inflation, so the, the amount of coverage you have on it stays constant from year to year. But if you, uh, I, I know everybody's aware that the market for cars and toys and all kinds of stuff is kind of skyrocketed. So if you've got a boat that's insured for twenty thousand dollars because that's what you paid for three or four or five years ago, and now the market forces have driven that value up to thirty thousand dollars, you may actually want to increase the amount of coverage on that because your insurance policy is not changing. Uh, with inflation on uh, those types of items. And Derek, what are insurance companies doing about inflation? Sure. So I, I'm just going to circle back to that real quickly, Dave. It, it sounds like there are certain coverages that are adjusted by the insurance company each year to account for changes in inflation, the consumer, the consumer price index, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there are also other coverages that are not revised, correct? Correct. Water backup, coverage for a detached garage, yeah. stated value for your boat or your snowmobile or uh, your recreational travel trailer. So although you know we're trying to manage costs in insurance premiums, we also want to keep in mind that if we bought that boat in 2018 for 20 grand, uh, today it might cost $40,000 to buy something similar. Um, so putting that little bit more uh, to ensure for its appropriate value, rather than having to fork out twenty grand, uh, you know, if it gets totaled, is, is probably a wise idea. So, um, what are insurance companies doing about it? Well, I, I think number one, um, they're offering more customization and flexibility than they ever have in the past. Uh, a lot of insurance companies have coverage packages that have traditionally been. Uh, suitable for most of their clients, right? Well, a lot of them are saying, we still offer this same coverage package, but we're going to allow the option to increase some of the coverages in this package, maybe strip a few of them out, and that allows each person to really tailor their policy based on the coverages that are appropriate to them. 
They're also adding some uh, bonus coverages, if you will, to help account for uh, some of the limitations that might be inherent in an insurance policy. So uh, maybe you keep property at a self-storage facility. Um, you know, maybe you have a certain type of boat or travel trailer or other type of coverage need. They're now allowing their clients to modify their policy in ways that they didn't allow in the past so that each person really does have the coverages that are important to them and not the ones that they don't need. So, uh, you know, I, I think one thing we like to point out with our clients is that the, at least Brian and I, Dave still a little bit because he married a, a CPA, we're, we're nerds, we're math nerds. So I think it's important for people to remember that they need to do a cost benefit analysis when they're evaluating their insurance policies. Uh, you'll talk to a lot of agents and they'll say, oh, you have a finished basement, then you need water backup coverage. Well, if it's extremely expensive for me to have water backup coverage, and I don't think I'm ever going to have that type of occurrence, then why would I buy insurance for that? I'll just forego the coverage, keep the premiums in my pocket, and if something happens to, have, happens to go wrong, I'll pay for it myself. So, you know, I think it's important to continue to do that cost-benefit analysis with, uh, you know, your spouse, your, your agent, whoever it is, to make sure that you don't necessarily have the coverages that someone would quote-unquote say you need. You have the coverages that are important to you and your specific risk tolerance. Derek, what's the cost-benefit analysis look like for uh, your spouse? That'd be an interesting one to see. <laughs> for my spouse, the benefit's very high. Just a little bit of a recap in terms of where we've come from since 2020 when the auto insurance law changed. Uh, a lot has occurred since then. We've had uh, COVID, of course, we've had inflation. Uh, we've got everything that's going on currently. So well, what are we expecting as we look ahead to 2023 and even beyond? Well, unfortunately, you may have gathered from some of the comments in this conversation that we are expecting to see some premium inflation, and we expect that to continue in 2023. Um, it takes six to 12 months or longer for insurance companies to get new rates approved by the state's insurance department, and during that time, rates are lagging behind claims costs. So we've been seeing inflated claims costs for over a year, really, without a whole lot of action on insurance premium changes. So the insurance companies are looking to catch up. In a low inflation environment, that's not usually a big deal, but when inflation spikes like it has lately, rates become inadequate pretty quickly. Um, insurance centers like us watch something called the combined ratio to see how insurance companies are doing financially. A combined ratio of 100 means that insurance companies are uh, paying out $1 for every in, in claims and company expenses for every dollar of premium they take in. So, currently the industry projection for 2022 is 101, which means that they're losing one cent on every dollar um, that they take in. Fortunately, insurance companies receive investment income with premiums and claim reserves that helps them keep afloat when the combined ratio is high. Um, and that, that combined ratio of 101 does not factor in Hurricane Ian, which just took place. So, the combined ratio will be higher than one on one, so insurance companies are not going to be uh, profitable uh, nationwide on average from an underwriting standpoint. <clears throat> now, I'm sure the thought of insurance companies losing money brings tears to your eyes, and we have tissues available if you need them. <laughs> <laughs> well, seriously, we, we do want to see reasonable profitability so that insur insurance companies maintain the financial strength necessary to pay all claims. And the expectation of making a reasonable profit is necessary to keep insurance companies interested in participating in our insurance market. Um, we don't want to become like California or Florida, where most known insurance companies have left the state because they know they can't ever make a profit there. If you have somebody who's trying to buy property insurance in Florida, anybody here? A little challenging. Uh, they would probably tell you it's a hot mess. And the average premium for a homeowner's policy is about three times the national average. And that was before Hurricane Ian, it's just going to get worse from here. Fortunately, we don't have catastrophic weather events or earthquakes, so our, our insurance market in Michigan is very stable, and we're thankful for that. So moving on, Derek, uh, how important <coughs> is uh, carrying adequate liability coverage these days? Yeah, sure. So um, if you've talked with the Moors or anyone on our team, you know that we have a pretty big emphasis on umbrella insurance. Uh, and just a quick reminder of what an umbrella policy is, it's, it's a separate policy. It's different from your auto policy, your homeowner's policy. Uh, it's a totally 
standalone policy on its own, and it provides additional lawsuit protection if there's a lawsuit against you for the ownership and use of your home, like a slip and fall on your driveway, and the ownership and use of your vehicles, like you hit a pedestrian or, God forbid, you cause a severe car accident and someone dies, that type of thing. It goes into you know, further detail than that, but just from a, a high level, that's what the umbrella policy does. So, um, as much as I don't like to equate insurance to gambling, um, the umbrella policy is very inexpensive. For usually somewhere between $150 and $300 per year, you can get a million dollars of lawsuit protection. If you want more than that, most insurance companies will go up to $5 million of coverage. Some will even go up to 10. So for a couple hundred bucks a year, you have protection of your nest egg, your uh, bank accounts, your home equity, uh, all of those types of things so that if something goes wrong, the insurance company is going to be there not only to number one, pay for your defense costs, but number two, settle that lawsuit against you, which as we saw earlier when Brian was talking about social inflation and other people actually investing in that lawsuit that someone might file against you is extremely important to have. Uh, five years ago, we would have said, they'll take your insurance money and, and they'll go away, right? Why are they gonna spend the time and the energy to pursue you for more than whatever your insurance amount is? Well, today, there's somebody that's funding them. They're gonna pay for whatever it is that uh, needs to be done for that lawsuit and keep that person's lifestyle as is while they pursue that lawsuit. So. Uh, that's the umbrella policy. If everybody opens up your little board insurance group uh, folder, there is a lotto ticket in there. So, that is how you are going to remember your umbrella policy. The person that wins, you know, ten or twenty or fifty thousand dollars is really going to like umbrella policies. Um, but it costs a whopping dollar for a board insurance group to go and buy a lotto ticket, right? That's the cost of your umbrella policies premium. Now. Someone might win 50 bucks, they might win 100, they might win $10,000. But that umbrella policy is there for you, as unlikely as it might be, if there's a large lawsuit against you and you need those defense costs and settling of that lawsuit. So, yes, it's unlikely, but there are people in here that play the lotto, right? If you're playing the lotto, you should have an umbrella policy as well. Um, so, you'll also see golf balls uh, at some of the tables, or maybe some of you grab some on your way in. What's the purpose of the golf ball? Well, that's another key component of an umbrella policy. It follows you. So, yeah, your home, you think about your property. Your vehicle, you think about being behind the wheel. Your umbrella policy, it follows you behind the wheel, at your house, and while you're on vacation in Florida. It follows you while you're camping up north. It follows you while you're on the golf course, hence the golf ball. So, if you're on the first tee and you're anything like Dave and you slice one three fairways over and you hit someone in the head and they have a brain injury that they're suing you for, well, you're going to be very thankful you had that umbrella policy because it followed you onto that golf course, right? And, lucky for Dave, umbrella policies aren't solely interested in slices, they also provide coverage for duck cooks as well. So, keep that in mind when you're thinking about your uh, umbrella policy. Right, overworked claim representatives. We're all overworked these days, but the claim representatives, I think in particular. Um, share a little bit more about that with us. Sure, yeah. So, what else are we going to see in, in the, you know, the remainder of 2022 and then going into 2023? Um, who in this room has had to file an insurance claim sometime in 2022? I know there are more than that based on the amount of claims being paid, um, but I can recall a few of those. Um, and hopefully that claim went smooth, and hopefully our team was there to help move it along and get things handled the way that they should be. But there is no secret that the claim side of the insurance industry is poorly staffed. And it's very challenging to recruit people into be a claim representative at the insurance company. It sounds sexy, sounds like you should be able to pick up people at the bar. That's not the case. Um, being a claim rep is a challenging job. It's a necessary job, uh, but it's very challenging to hire the appropriate amount of people into the claim service side of things in the insurance industry compared to the amount of claims that are being filed and need to be handled. So. 
what to expect going forward. When you do hear from the claim representative or they ask you for some, some sort of documentation, do your best to get it to them time. Don't expect them to be able to follow up every two days with a reminder because they've got too many claims that they're trying to handle and not enough time to get it done. So when you do get them on the phone, get as far as you can in that process. If they do ask you for this paperwork, turn it around and get it back to them. And if things aren't moving or you need somebody to step in somewhere, let our team know. Because we have resources behind the scenes that can help get action when action is needed. Um, but there's no, there's no secret that the claim side of things is struggling from a service standpoint. What are they going to do about it? Technology is one thing, and we're seeing that on the underwriting side of things as well, right? So the insurance underwriting side, it's much more and more, it's more and more important to fit into the computer algorithm and all the actuarial data in terms of what are they looking for and how are they pricing insurance products. So keep your, your credit score high. Don't get any silly, uh, silly speeding tickets. Uh, don't file those silly small little claims. Uh, because the insurance industry is becoming more and more automated, not only from a claim service standpoint, but also from an underwriting standpoint and how things are being priced from a coverage standpoint. So, um, with that, Dave, why don't you take us home? Well, unless you want to hear another golf joke. <laughs> <laughs> that wraps up our program. Uh, we appreciate you being here today. and. Uh, if you have any friends or relatives that need uh, the help of an agency to manage their insurance, we'd be honored to help them. And uh, again, thank you for coming out. We appreciate it. Yeah, and we'll uh, we'll answer a couple questions. If you do have to uh, scurry out of here, feel free to do so. We will not take offense to that. Um, so yeah, thanks again, everybody, for coming. We really appreciate it. And um, we'll start right here. John, I already had enough of you this morning. So why don't we start that back? <laughs> percentage wise increase in my whole policy. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, on the auto insurance side of things, we're seeing eight to thirteen okay. percent right now uh, on the home insurance. Home insurance thankfully has really been tracking the coverage adjustment. So they're really not adjusting the rate. What we're seeing is twelve to fifteen, you know, nine to sixteen percent if you will, premium increase, which is tracking exactly what the increase to the coverage amount on the policy. Okay. And second quick question, uh, having uh, a 15-year-old driver that's soon to be turning 16, is it still, would, be, would it be cost-effective to convert one of the cars in the family to keep the LPD insurance on that? Can, you still, can we still do that? Is that something that was just the old thing that you can't do no more to put them as a primary driver on that car with the LPD? You can, you can do that. And each insurance company will assign the drivers slightly different based on their own methods, but um, anytime you have a young driver, having a PLPD vehicle makes a world of difference. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. My question. Um, can you explain a little bit more about why the credit, your credit rating or your credit score has anything to do with your insurance? Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, the, the question was, explain why your credit rating has an impact on the price of your insurance. And I've heard people say before, you know, I've paid my insurance premiums in full for 50 years. Do they think I'm not good for it? And that's why they're looking at my credit. The answer is no. Um, statistically, people with higher credit scores, which we technically can't say that insurance companies are using credit scores. We have to call them insurance scores. But they're credit scores. Um, they're, they're, these credit scores are very indicative of the likelihood of someone filing a claim. They're actually the number one indicator of how likely someone is to file a claim. Now, you have to keep in mind that this is across the board, right? Millions and millions of people, this is indicative. Uh, there are certain instances where people have a very high credit score and they file claims every month. Now, some people with very low credit scores, they've never filed a claim in their life. But when you take an entire population, statistically, uh, people with high credit scores tend to file less claims. Is it because they're maintaining their home better and they're replacing the roof when it needs it instead of you know trying to squeak an extra five years out of it? Are they you know replacing their brakes and their tires and um, you know that type of thing? Is it the financial stability? Is it just the um, you know kind of uh, put togetherness of someone that might have that high credit score, I, I don't know necessarily what it is, but uh, what the insurance companies do is they, they take what they say, the credit information, because again, they cannot use a credit score, but they take all the credit information that goes into a credit score and they call it an insurance score. 
and each insurance company determines what that insurance score is based on their own criteria. So with one insurance company, your insurance score might be 800. With another one, it might be 730. With another one, it might be 610. Because some of them are going to place emphasis on different components of that credit score based on the type of client that they're trying to attract. So I think what's important to keep in mind, Linda, regardless of how you feel about insurance companies using that, which they all do, and they've done that for 20 years in our state, um, for 95% of our clients, they pay less in insurance costs because insurance companies are allowed to do that. If you remember that when the law changed in 2020, there was this big push that they weren't going to use credit reporting for developing insurance costs. If that happened, our clients, and this side of the state especially, would have seen a dramatic increase in insurance costs. Because so, you have to remember the total cost of car accidents or homeowners claims, it's all going into this big pool, right? And you're just trying to say, of that total cost, how much am I going to be responsible for paying for? And that's your insurance premium. So by using credit score or not using credit score, it's not going to change the total cost of insurance for a society. It's just how much is being allocated to each person. So um, yeah, you want to keep your credit score high. That's the number one dictator of what you pay for your insurance. I, I, I can't understate how important it is to uh, try to maintain a high credit score. Today, thanks for making time to join us over at lunch. Uh,